So today we're talking about geologic time. This is topic seven. This is based on chapter 18. So Earth's evolution through time. This topic is focused around the history, evolution and development of the Earth. We will review how to put rock layers and geologic events like faulting and folding in chronological order based on the principles of dating. We will discuss how to determine how old rock layers are and how old fossils are using radioactive dating. And we will also examine how life on Earth has evolved over time, including how oceans and the atmosphere developed. So relative dating, we will begin by looking at rock layers and geologic events such as faulting, folding, or igneous intrusions. And we will work to determine the order in which such geologic events happened and the timing of when rock layers formed. So how can we determine which rock layer is older? So these are sedimentary rock layers, and we're going to use what's called relative dating to figure out which rock layer is older. So when you look at these rock layers, A is the one that's on top, and B is a little bit further down. So A is actually younger because it was deposited more recently. And B is older because it was deposited before layer A. <clears throat> it was already there. So when you look at this, you can think of like layers of snow, okay? Whereas B would be a layer of snow that fell a couple of weeks ago. And then let's say it never melted and then you have more snow fall. So the snow that's on top is the new snow that just fell recently. So in, in, the, in this type of comparison, when you say like one layer is older, one's younger, that is relative dating. So relative dating is determining the chronological order of geologic events. It's, so we're not necessarily going to discuss snow and like what layers are the younger snow. We'll discuss it in terms of sedimentary layers, igneous intrusions, and things like that. So relative dating does not involve actual ages, though. So it's as if this person is asking their friend, hey, Sammy, how old are you? And the friend Sammy says, I'm older than my sister and younger than my brother. So there's no ages involved, okay? They're not saying like how old they actually are. They're just saying relative to other people, how old they are. So that's relative dating. Okay, it's older versus younger relative to something else. So there are different principles used in relative dating. The principle of original horizontality, and that tells us that all sediments are initially deposited in horizontal layers. And you can see on this diagram of rock layers, you can see that the rock layers are all flat horizontal layers. Then we have the principle of superposition. That tells us that sedimentary rock layers that have not been disturbed lie in order of how they were deposited. The oldest rock layers are on the bottom. The more recent deposits are younger and are on top. 
Then we have the principle of lateral continuity. And that I have these two yellow arrows pointing to the same rock layer that's not any that's not next to each other. Like you have to walk pretty far to get from one of the ends of the rock layer to the other where the other arrow is pointing. So that's showing us that sedimentary rock layers are deposited in continuous layers and can therefore be correlated with nearby deposits. So in this case, you can actually trace that deposit along like this entire canyon. This is a, a picture just showing more about the original horizontality principle. These are rock layers in an area of Ithaca, which is upstate New York. And all of the sediments were deposited flat in horizontal layers. Again, that's similar to how snow is deposited in flat layers. Okay, so that's the original horizontality. We know that these rock layers were not disturbed by faulting or folding. Here is more explanation about the lateral continuity. So if erosion were to remove the rock material in between these areas of rock, you can still say that the rock layer that I have here is the blue stripe. You can say that it's probably the same rock layer and it's probably the same age, even though these could be like a few miles away from each other. Because we assume that the rocks were once continuous layers. Okay, so each of these peaks where it like goes up, each of those could be like five miles away from each other. Okay, but we're assuming that this rock layer used to be continuous going across the one that's like the blue stripe there. This is a diagram from the textbook showing lateral continuity. So the top picture shows you the sedimentary rock layers. And then in the middle, you have erosion that happens later on. And you're showing that the rock layers on either side of this valley here, that's probably a river valley. It looks like a river valley. So the rock layers on either side, you're assuming that they used to be all continuous going across and that they're the same rocks, that they're the same ages. A fourth principle used in relative dating is the principle of cross-cutting relationships. And this is related to faulting, folding, fractures, things like that, igneous intrusions. So rock layers need to be in existence in order for them to be faulted, folded, and fractured. That means when you see a fault in rock layers, the faults are always going to be younger and more recent events than the rock layer, the formation of the rock layers. Okay, so the rock layers formed earlier than the faulting happened. So when it comes to like discussing what's older, what's younger, the fault is always going to be younger than the formation of the rock layers. Igneous intrusions can only intrude rocks that already exist. So igneous intrusions like dikes and sills are always younger than the rocks that they intrude. And then contact metamorphism, it's in the same category. Contact metamorphism can only occur on rocks that are already there. So contact metamorphism is always a more recent event 
than the formation of the rocks that undergo metamorphism. So here are some intrusions and some folds. Okay, so the intrusions and the folds are all younger and more recent events than the formation of the rocks that were there already. A fifth principle is the principle of inclusions. And this explains that fragments included in a rock are older than the rock itself. So like the rock fragments had to already be formed and existing before they could be incorporated into another rock. So an example would be a conglomerate. So the pebbles in the conglomerate are older than the conglomerate itself because the pebbles had to exist first before they were included into the conglomerate. So the pebbles are always older than the rock they are um, included in. So we can examine the geologic record and decipher what happened in the geologic past by looking at rock layers and looking at relative dating of faulting and folding and, and things like that. So the rock layers show us a record of the geologic history of an area. The sedimentary rock layers indicate different depositional environments. Metamorphic rocks indicate different events like mountain building, or if it's contact metamorphism, it would be um, a lava flow. And fossils mark periods of time if we know how old the fossils are. If anyone has any questions, you could write the questions in the chat box. So then we have the term unconformity. Unconformities are breaks in the geologic record caused by erosion, or it could be a period of time where you did not have any sediment accumulating. But generally we talk about it being related to erosion. So if more sediments are later deposited on top of an erosional surface, then there will be a missing time period in the rock record, which we call a hiatus. So step one on my diagram here shows you layers of sedimentary rock. Step two involves erosion of the top layers of the sedimentary rock. And then later on, you have more deposition on top of the erosional surface. But now you're missing the rocks that eroded away. So that's your unconformity. Okay, you're missing the time period of the, of the eroded sediments. So that's your hiatus is like how much time you're missing is the hiatus. There are three types of unconformities, disconformity, angular unconformity, and nonconformity. A disconformity is when the upper layers of sediments are eroded and then more sediments are deposited later on overlying the erosional surface. So all of the rock layers are still flat horizontal sedimentary layers, but there's an erosional surface in the middle there somewhere. That's a disconformity. 
often disconformities can be difficult to recognize because they basically just look similar to continuous flat rock layers. We can use fossils to identify and find a disconformity though. So fossils definitely help in this case. And disconformities, the rock layers are all, are all going to be parallel and flat. Well, in this case, they're flat, but later on they could be tilted and then you would still be able to find is it disconformity if you have fossils. So here's another diagram of disconformity. <clears throat> Let's see in the chat, what's the difference between this and unconformities? Unconformities is just like the main um, topic name. And then there were three types of, of unconformities. So a disconformity is just one type of unconformity. And then there were two other types. So in this case, you have another diagram of a disconformity. Okay, it's all parallel rock layers, then you had erosion, and then you had more deposition on top. The next type of unconformity is an angular unconformity. That is when rock layers are tilted or folded. And then erosion happens. And then you have more sediment deposited on top. So the older rock layers dip at a different angle than the younger overlying sedimentary layers. So in this photo, you have flat layers of sediment on top of tilted sedimentary rocks. And this shows you a timeline. So you have deposition of rock layers and then uplift that causes the tilting of the rock layers. And then erosion happens that flattens out that surface. And then later on, you have more deposition of sedimentary rock layers on top of the tilted rocks. So at that point where you have the flat layers on top of the tilted layers. That's your, un your angular unconformity. Then we have nonconformities. Nonconformities are when metamorphic or igneous bedrock is eroded and then sediments are deposited on top of the erosional surface. These may look like igneous intrusions rather than nonconformities. But what happens is you would look for inclusions of the bedrock in the overlying sedimentary rocks to determine what happened there. Also, if there is contact metamorphism, it is a sill. If there's no contact metamorphism at the boundary, it is a nonconformity. So if we kind of zoom in here, you have this area where you have this granite that's 550 million years old below this red line. And then above the line, you have sedimentary sandstone about 450 million years old. So there was erosion that happened that removed about 100 million years worth of, of materials. So this is, an, this is a nonconformity. So anytime you have igneous or metamorphic rocks with sedimentary on top, it's, it's a nonconformity unless you have contact metamorphism at the boundary, which would tell us that it's a sill or an igneous intrusion instead of a nonconformity. 
But also when I was seeing um, with the, with inclusions, so what that means is at this boundary, if part of the sandstone has like little pebbles made up of this granite, then that tells us that the granite eroded <clears throat> and then got incorporated into the sandstone. So then we know it's a nonconformity as opposed to a sill, which is an igneous intrusion. So in New York City, we have nonconformities because we have metamorphic bedrock with more um, recent glacial deposits on top and then recent soil. So New York City has a nonconformity. So here's another diagram of a nonconformity. Igneous or metamorphic rocks, then erosion, and then younger sedimentary layers on top. And you could see pieces of the bedrock, pieces of the igneous and metamorphic bedrock incorporated in that lower layer of the sedimentary rock which shows you that erosion left like pebbles and stuff on the land surface at the erosion, at the erosional surface and then those pebbles were incorporated into the new sedimentary rock. So the Grand Canyon actually has all of the three types of unconformities. So this shows you the disconformity in the Grand Canyon, the angular unconformity in the Grand Canyon, and the nonconformity in the Grand Canyon. So it's just, this is a diagram from the book and it's pretty helpful in showing the different unconformities. Okay, so you could read, you could um, look through the details there. So then I have this little activity where we're going to correlate rock layers that are far from each other. So outcrop, the word outcrop just means a rock layer um, that's sticking out at the surface of the earth, that you're able to see it. That's what an outcrop is. So these outcrops would be similar to like this picture here. Or like this is an outcrop. This is outcropping. Okay, so similar to this, where you have these three outcrops of rock, and we're going to correlate the rock layers. I'll show you how to do it. So rock, outcrop A is about 40 miles away from outcrop B. And then B and C are about 35 miles apart. The principles of superposition, original horizontality, and cross-cutting relationships only allows for relative dating of events in the rock record at a single location. But once we start looking at the principle of lateral continuity, then we could compare similar rock records from one location to another. That's what we're gonna do now. So we're gonna mac match rock layers that we think are similar ages in different regions that's called correlation. We're going to look for matching patterns in these three outcrops. And the matching patterns are called sequences. Now, what I mean by this is the first thing we see is this volcanic ash layer because I highlighted it with a red circle. But that's what I noticed first was there was a volcanic ash. So volcanic ash tells me that there was some sort of volcanic eruption 
probably only one eruption, right? And the ash was deposited over a widespread area. So we could use the ash layers to interpret the rock events in all three locations as being younger or older than the eruption. I'll show you how that works here. So if you look above the volcanic ash, everything is younger because of superposition. If you look below the volcanic ash, everything is older than the volcanic ash. So let's look for some patterns. Above the volcanic ash in outcrop A, you have tan limestone, conglomerate, brown sandstone, tan siltstone. Let's look at outcrop B. Above the volcanic ash, you have tan limestone and conglomerate. So these rocks kind of match. Volcanic ash, tan limestone conglomerate. Volcanic ash, tan limestone conglomerate. That is a sequence or a pattern that matches. So now we look at outcrop C. Volcanic ash, tan limestone conglomerate. We're back to having some brown sandstone, just like outcrop A. So when you start to look at the sequences and the patterns, they match. So then we can start to say, well, perhaps all the volcanic ash layers are the same age. And then all of the tan limestones directly above the volcanic ash are also the same age as each other. All of the conglomerates above the tan limestone are all the same age as each other. And then the brown sandstone is the same age as each other. Outcrop B does not have brown sandstone. Perhaps it was eroded away. And you could do the same thing for below the volcanic ash. Green shale, gray siltstone. Volcanic ash, green shale, gray siltstone. So we're assuming the green shells and the gray siltstones are the same age as each other because of lateral continuity. It's just that some of the outcrops are showing a little bit higher up than others, but that's okay. Volcanic ash, green shell, gray siltstone, okay? But then here on outcrop C, below the great siltstone, you have an erosional surface and then red sandstone. Here also you have an erosional surface and then red sandstone. So that is how you do the correlation. You just kind of match up the patterns. And you, the key is helpful as well, right? The squiggly line is the unconformity. So you have an unconformity between the gray siltstone and the red sandstone. Now, which outcrop contains the youngest rocks? Anyone think they know? Which outcrop contains the youngest rocks? Correct, and how did you get that? So in the chat, it, someone wrote letter A. I'm not gonna say names because I'm recording this, so. Right, would it be A because there were more layers on top than the other outcrops? Correct. That is correct. Yeah, so you see there were more layers on top of the volcanic ash in outcrop A than are on top of the volcanic ash in the other layer, in the other outcrops. Right, so outcrop A contains the youngest rocks.
And which rock layer is the oldest? Which actual rock layer is the oldest? So oldest are always gonna be on the bottom. Youngest is always gonna be on top. So what, what is the name of the rock layer that is the oldest? So it is actually the black shell. That is correct. So if you, if as you go deeper into the ground, it's older rock layers. If you look at outcrop A, there's only green shell and gray siltstone below it. Outcrop B has the green shell, gray siltstone, and then there's red sandstone, gray limestone, and black shell. Outcrop C, you have the green shell, gray siltstone, red sandstone, and gray limestone. So outcrop B is the only one that has an extra rock layer all the way at the bottom, which is the black shell. So black shell is actually the oldest rock layer out of all of them, out of this whole entire correlation. Black shell is the oldest out of everything. Then the gray limestone is younger than the black shell, but it's also pretty old compared to everything else. Does that make sense? Black shell is the oldest rock layer. I know the question I have on the screen says which outcrop contains the youngest rock and the oldest rock but I just, I changed the question just now to which is the ro oldest rock layer. I have a question, oh, Professor. Good. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh. okay, so um, for the outcrop B, right? So do we, since it's an extra um, stone, which is the black shale you said, so do we have to look at all the outcrop and see what they have, um, and similar? In order to find out that black shell is the oldest out of all of them? Yes. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so now we're going to talk about fossils. Now, fossils are very, very helpful to us in determining the geologic record and chronology. So these are some fossils from the textbook. We got some fish fossils. We have some tiny shells. And then we have a trilobite on the bottom. So this diagram shows you fossil ranges. The black lines represent the range a species existed for. Long lines tell us that the species existed over a long period of time. If the line is short, that means the, the species only existed for a short period of time. So I will zoom in here. Okay, so on the left, it shows periods. Now we did not get up to period names yet, but we will, in a, we will soon. But those are periods of time from the geologic time scale. So Quaternary is recent, Cambrian is older. So Keep in mind, this goes from oldest at the bottom to more recent on the top of the diagram.
Okay, so when you look at, let's say, animals with shells, it's a really long line. When you look at reptiles, that starts in the period called Pennsylvanian and goes up to modern times. So reptiles did not exist for as long a time as, let's say, fish. Okay, fish started really early in this diagram. Reptiles did not start until later. Mammals has a shorter line that started towards middle to the end of the Triassic period. Many of you probably heard of the Jurassic. Okay, that's one of the periods. Okay, birds, humans is a very short line compared to all the others. Okay, and then on the other side, we have plants. So flowering plants did not start existing until more recently. See, it's a, all the way on the right of the diagram. It says flowering plants. That's a short line as well. But like mosses and ferns existed for a long time. Okay, so that's just fossil ranges. And this helps us because let's say you find bird fossils in your rock, then you know that the rock is relatively more recent. I mean, it's still like millions of years old, but it's a more recent fossil because birds only started existing more recently in geologic terms. Also, we can look at what's called fossil assemblages. Basically, it's a bunch of fossils in different, of different species present in a rock. So when we look at the ranges for when those species existed in the geologic time scale, it helps us to constrain a time period that the rock was formed during. So this shows you general, older is at the bottom, younger is on top, just kind of like the diagram we just looked at. And in this case, it has white lines instead of black lines. So it shows you age ranges of some fossil groups. So like this maple leaf is more young. Okay, the dinosaur fossil is a little bit older than the maple leaf, right? And then on the bottom left, you have this trilobite fossil, which stopped existing at some point. Okay, so when you look at, let's say, rock unit A, it has all of these different fossils in it. So when you link up where all of those fossils existed at the same time period, you get this pink line across the age ranges. So we know that the age of rock unit A is somewhere in this pink line. Now, there's no numbers here to make it simpler. Okay, so the more fossils you have in a rock, the easier it is to figure out how old the rock is because you just see like where all of the age, the age ranges match up. So when you look at the, when you look at rock layer A, it has a maple leaf and a dinosaur fossil. So the only time that both of those species existed or both of those fossil groups existed at the same time, they only overlap where the pink stripe is. You see that? That's the only time that they overlap. So that tells us how old the rock layer is. It's where those existed at the same time. Rock unit B has other fossils in it. So you see where those all match up at the same time. And that is the blue stripe. Okay. 
Okay, so that's how you use fossil assemblages. Um, let's take a 10 minute break. We can come back at 2.10. I'm gonna pause the recording. Next, we have index fossils. Index fossils are remains of organisms that are species that existed for a brief time period. Keep in mind, when you talk about a brief time period in geology, that could mean like 10 million years. Index fossils are remains of organisms that are species that existed across a widespread area, such as a sea or across a continent. And they're also species that had distinct identifiable features. So an example is a group of floating organisms called graptolites that were common in some ancient seas that used to cover New York State at different times in the past. So we had shallow seas that covered New York and part, you know, other parts of the Northeast and other parts of North America and other continents. We had ancient seas like millions of years ago that covered the continental land. So rock layers that contain these graptolite fossils can be dated because we know that graptolites only existed between a short time period, 485 to 358 million years ago. That is the time period graptolites existed for. So a graptolite is shown here. It, when you see a graptolite fossil, it looks like someone took a piece of shale rock or like a mudstone. <clears throat> Excuse me. It looks like they took a mudstone and drew lines on it with pencil. That's where the name graptolite comes from. It's like a drawing. So it, it actually looks like someone like, like drew with pencil. So the scale on this top diagram, it's a half a centimeter is that red line. So these are really small. And the sketch on the bottom is what a graptolite probably looked like. So anyway, because we know that graptolites only existed between 485 and 358 million years ago, if you find a graptolite fossil, we know that that rock that contains the graptolite fossil is between 485 and 358 million years old. So in that case, graptolites are able to be index fossils. Okay, they mark a time period when they're found in a rock layer. Index fossils are similar to like time capsules. A time, anyone know what a time capsule is? A time capsule is like when you're in elementary school and they, you know, you might do a project where they say, okay, we're going to make a time capsule and yeah, you bury some things. I don't know if people do those anymore, but I know, I know that when I was in elementary school, we buried a time capsule. I don't know where we buried it because we were little. So like the teacher buried, you know, I don't know if they even did actually bury them. But yeah, you, you, you dig them up at a certain time. So like the time capsule might say like, you know, open this in 30 years or open this in 50 years or whatever. And you put in things like, I don't know, like if you were to find a time capsule 
with like um, Spice Girl, a Spice Girls CD or whatever. You know, you could interpret the age of the time capsule. Yeah, like like VHS tapes and things like that. Or like old, you know, old toys, right? That's good that what you guys are writing in the chat. Yeah. So those things mark time periods because they all we consider that them only existing for a short period of time. So usually a time capsule will be things that are like trendy and popular at that particular time period. Okay, like cell phones would be good index fossils because they're certain cell phones are popular for a certain time period and then you know people move on and get more advanced phones okay so anything you would put in a time capsule would be a good index fossil so in this case we're talking about like species that existed for a short period of time but that are recognizable but keep in mind when you're talking about a short period of time in geology Again, that could be like a few million years. Okay, so now that brings us to absolute dating. So all up until now, we've only been talking about relative dating, where you don't actually have like specific time periods that you got from dating the rocks through methods that we're gonna talk about now. Okay, it was all just relative dating so far. So now we're going to start absolute dating. So scientists relied solely on relative dating methods until the discovery of radioactivity at the end of the 1800s. And radioactivity was discovered by a scientist named Marie Curie. And I believe she actually died from radio from uh, radiation poisoning, or maybe it was cancer. I don't remember exactly, but um, she died from dealing with radioactive materials. She didn't, you know, people didn't know that, you know, what radioactivity could do to like a human body. So, you know, they were dealing with uranium, not knowing that it was deadly to deal with radioactivity. Um, some radioactive materials are not very radioactive, but other radioactive materials are very radioactive. So absolute dating it deals with methods for determining the ages of rock units or events. And the ages are described as years before present. Absolute dating typically relies on radioactive decay techniques. So we use radioactive isotopes like carbon-14. I'm going to go through all of the details. Okay, so here's the, the two friends talking again. A friend asks, hey, Sammy, how old are you? And the friend says, I am exactly 22 years and three months old. So now we have actual ages involved. Okay, so this is different from relative dating where you didn't really discuss ages, exact ages. Even with index fossils, you would say, you know, between this range of ages because the fossils in there. But in this case, you're actually dating the rocks and the fossils with actual ages. Okay, so what is an isotope, right? We talk here, it says using radioactive isotopes. So we need to know what isotopes are. Isotopes are atoms of the same element that have different amounts of neutrons. So carbon-12, carbon-13, and carbon-14 are all isotopes of carbon. Carbon-12 has six neutrons. Carbon-13 has seven neutrons. 
and carbon-14 has eight neutrons. That's just how it works, okay? These, there, are, there are three isotopes of carbon. They have different numbers of neutrons. Carbon-14 happens to be a radioactive isotope of carbon. Radioactive means that it decays over time. So we're going to see carbon-14 decay. Carbon-13 does not. So radioactivity means that some isotopes are unstable and their nucleus will spontaneously decay transforming to other more stable isotopes of elements. So most isotopes are stable. So carbon-13 is stable and it does not decay. When they say spontaneously decay, it just means like you don't know exactly when it's gonna happen. It just like spontaneously happens. We can say it like that. Okay, the parent isotope is what we call the unstable radioactive isotope. So carbon-14 is unstable and it's radioactive. The daughter product is the isotope that results from the decay of the parent. The half-life is the time required for one half of the radioactive nuclei in a sample to decay. So when we say spontaneously decay, there is actually a time period in which we can expect radioactive nuclei to decay. Okay, there is actually an amount of time that this happens depending on the isotope. And that's the half-life. Half-life is half of the radioactive nuclei will decay within the half-life. And I'll show you a chart in a few minutes. Specific isotopes have different half-lives. So there are different types of nuclear decay. We have alpha emission. That means that a radioactive parent will lose what we call an alpha particle which is two, pro two protons and two neutrons. Beta emission means that the parent isotope loses an electron, which is a beta particle. And then electron capture is a nucleus captures an electron, which converts a proton to a neutron. So this chart shows you radioactive decay where you have the atomic number on the bottom and the atomic number. No, that doesn't make sense. The um, atomic mass number versus the atomic number. That's a mistake. Okay, so some isotopes undergo only one decay step in order to transform to a stable element. <clears throat> For example, rubidium-87 decays to something called strontium-87, and that's only through one decay step called a beta emission. Okay, but some isotopes have to undergo several decay steps in order to become a stable isotope. So uranium-238 goes through several steps in order to become lead-206, which is stable. So I'll show you how that works here. So we start with uranium-238, and then it undergoes an alpha emission and becomes 
thorium 234. And then that goes through two beta emissions. And then you have a bunch of alpha emissions, then a bunch of beta emissions and alpha, beta, beta, and then an alpha. And then you are left with lead 206, which is your stable isotope. Now, I just want to point out radon, which is somewhere in the middle here, radon 222, right? Radon is actually um, a gas that can cause environmental issues. Radon gas is radioactive. So in some areas, radon gas can build up in, let's say, someone's basement because it comes from the rocks underneath the person's home, radon gas can like build up and accumulate and it is radioactive. So you don't want to breathe that in. So in some areas of the world, people have fans in their homes that help, that help um, get rid of the radon gas buildup so it doesn't cause problems for the people who live in the home. And this shows you the radioactive decay curve. So the bottom of it shows you the number of half-lives. And then the y-axis shows you the percentage of radioactive isotope remaining. So the way that you read this is after one half-life, okay, go to the x-axis and look at half-life numbers. After one half-life, you go up to where the curve is. It says 50. So that's percent of radioactive isotope remaining. So after one half-life, 50% of the parent atoms are left, and there are 50% daughter atoms. That's what that means. After two half-lives, you have 25% of the parent atoms left and 75% daughter atoms. And then so on and so on. So after three half-lives, you have 13% atoms of the parent isotope and 87% of the daughter. If so you keep, you keep cutting in half the number of parent atoms. Okay, so using radioactive isotopes to date igneous rocks. Radioactive parent atoms can become incorporated into crystal structures of various igneous minerals, for example, zircon. There is a picture of zircon here in this slide. So as crystals form from cooling magma, radioactive parent atoms will be incorporated into the crystals. Daughter atoms that might be in the magma are not incorporated because they're different sizes from the parent. All daughter atoms in rocks were formed after cooling. Okay, so once the rock forms out of cooled magma, it starts like a timer. And that's when the parent atoms start to decay into daughter atoms. So if the, when we look at like a zircon crystal from a rock, it helps us to figure out how old the rock is because you can look at how many daughter versus parent isotopes are in the zircon crystals. And then that can tell us how old the rock is. Okay. And I will go over like more in more detail how that works. Um, 
I'm just reading something, hold on. Accurate dating techniques can help you um, calculate the age of the rock. It's pretty accurate. So we use something called a mass spectrometer and it counts the number of parent and daughter atoms. And then you look at the ratio, like the percent of daughter to parent. And then you use the half-life. So basically you use this chart here after actually counting the atoms with the mass spectrometer. Okay, so this is a picture of a mass spectrometer. It's like this huge machine that's kind of like a square, a cube shape. And what's going on inside is here. So you have, like, let's say you'll take a zircon crystal out of the rock. And then you prepare the zircon crystal by dissolving it. And then you get the material from the zircon crystal that you're put into this mass spectrometer. So the mass spectrometer will ionize the sample, which is like the dissolved zircon crystal. And then it breaks it down into the different atoms that are in the sample. So depending on the weight of the atom, it's going to go through this curved tube at different speeds. So it actually separates the different atoms and then it actually counts them. So it'll count how many daughter atoms and how many parent atoms there are. And then you use that ratio on this chart here. So if there are 100% parent atoms and no daughter, that means zero half-lives have elapsed. If you have 50% parent, 50% daughter, that means one half-life has elapsed, and so on. But zircon specifically is a really helpful crystal. It's a helpful mineral. for us. Any questions about that? Basically, you're able to take certain minerals and count the percentages of parent versus daughter atoms. That's like the summary of all of this. And then when you count it tells you how old the rock is that you got the zircon from. It's pretty cool, actually. Then we have radioactive dating using carbon-14. So carbon-14 is used more for like organic materials because the half-life of carbon-14 is 5,730 years. So you can't really go back too far in history and use carbon-14 dating. So carbon-14 dating is more useful for things like if you're an anthropologist or an archeologist, or you're looking at more recent fossils. So this just goes over the life cycle of carbon-14. Carbon-14 forms in the atmosphere. And then because it's something we breathe, we breathe in carbon dioxide. And our bodies have a lot of carbon in it. Like we have carbon in us. So once plants and animals die, their cells stop incorporating carbon-14. And then the, the carbon-14 is able to start decaying. 
Okay. So carbon-14 dating will really just date when an organism died. Okay. You stop breathing in new carbon dioxide. You stop getting new carbon-14 as a plant or an animal. So if you did carbon-14 dating, you're just dating back to when the animal or the plant stopped incorporating new carbon-14. So these are common isotopes used in absolute dating. Uranium-238 is the parent. It turns into lead-206. And the half-life is four and a half billion years. So uranium-238 is really helpful for us to date old rocks. So is uranium-235 and thorium. Now, potassium argon is actually really helpful to date volcanic ash. And then I added carbon-14 to the, to the diagram here because it wasn't listed, to the table. Carbon-14 turns into nitrogen-14. And I put the half-life here. So that talks about dating igneous rocks. You could also date metamorphic rocks. <clears throat> but what about dating sedimentary rocks? Radioactive dating techniques are not very useful for dating sedimentary rocks. That's because the sediments are made up of pieces from older pre-existing rocks. So if you were to go to the beach right now and date the sand grains, you would get ages that are like millions and millions and millions of years old. That doesn't tell you how old the actual beach is as like a deposit of a beach. If I were to date a conglomerate, I would only be getting the ages of the pebbles that make up the conglomerate. Yeah. Excuse me, you don't know like how old the actual conglomerate is. So in order to figure out the age of, of sedimentary rocks, you're going to have to look for other things like volcanic rock layers. That's what we did earlier on in the lecture. There was a volcanic layer. You can actually date volcanic ash and lava using potassium argon isotopes. You have to look for igneous intrusions and then date the igneous intrusion. And you can look for fossils and date the fossils or use index fossils that you already know approximate dates for. But all you can do is still say like these sediments are older than this igneous intrusion or younger than this igneous intrusion. I'll show you how that works. So here's a diagram and it shows you some rock layers and then there's a volcanic ash layer and then there's an igneous dike. So the only ages we have available are the igneous materials, the volcanic ash and the igneous intrusion. So we're going to examine the positions of sedimentary rock layers in relation to igneous rock intrusions, the plutons, dikes, sills. In this case, we just have a volcanic ash layer and a dike. In order to estimate the ages of sedimentary rock layers. For example, the Wasatch Formation, which is the pink all the way on the top, it's like reddish pink. We want to figure out how old that is. Okay, so take a minute. See if you can figure out how old this upper layer of this whole sequence is, the Wasatch Formation. Look 
in terms of where the igneous dike is intruding and look at where the volcanic ash layer is and look at the numbers. And then you're going to fill in. The Wasatch Formation must be younger than blank million years old. And the Dakota Sandstone is younger than blank million years old and older than blank million years old. Okay, so you're gonna, you're gonna, you could write it in the chat. There are, so there are three numbers that you could write in a row. Okay, so take a minute to write that out. Take a minute to think about that. Again, you're looking, the Wasatch Formation must be younger than blank million years old. Let's just do that one first. Look at what numbers are available to us. Yes, yes, that is correct. So the Wasatch, the Wasatch formation must be younger than 66 million years old. That is correct. Okay, the igneous intrusion does not go through the Wasatch formation. The Wasatch Formation formed after the igneous intrusion went through the other rock layers. Okay, the Dakota Sandstone is younger than blank million years old and older than blank million years old. The Dakota Sandstone is the tannish yellow color in the middle. Yes, that is correct. I was just waiting to see if anyone else put it also. Yes, yeah, so the Dakota Sandstone is younger than 160 million years old, older than 66 million years old. So the Dakota Sandstone is above the volcanic ash, which is 160 million years, meaning it's younger than 160, because it's above it. Okay, so let's try another one. What is the relative age range of the sandstone layer? We can say the sandstone is younger than blank and older than blank. So we have, you're basically looking at the sandstone is here. This purple going down the middle here is a basalt dike. This kind of requires you to remember what a dike is from the igneous chapter. It's an intrusion that goes at an angle to the rocks. And then you have the granite is this pink at the bottom. Okay, so take a couple of minutes and then write the answer in the chat box.
Keep in mind the numbers you have. Again, this purple stripe going hard, like on an angle is a basalt dike that's 570 million years old. And the granite all the way at the bottom that's pink is 1.4 billion years old. So how old is the sandstone? It's actually backwards. Because you can't be younger than 570 million, but also older than 1.4 billion. So the words are backwards. Think of the answer that I wrote here. We can say the sandstone is younger than and older than, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, I mean, you had the right answer. You just had it backwards. Anyone wanna write what they think the correct answer is? Wait, but fill it in in the way that I wrote it. We can say the sandstone is younger than blank and older than blank. Okay, so if the granite is all the way at the bottom, the granite is at the bottom, the sandstone is at a higher level closer to the surface than the granite. So is sandstone older or younger than the granite? Is sandstone older or younger than granite? Sandstone is younger than granite because it's above it. So the sandstone is younger than 1.4 billion years. Correct. The last one is correct, yeah. Right, so if the sandstone is above the granite, it's younger. So san the sandstone is younger than 1.4 billion years, but the basalt dike goes through the sandstone and dikes are always younger than the rocks that they intrude. So the sandstone is older than 570 million years. Okay, so it's, it's the last one here. The sandstone is younger than 1.4 billion and older than 570 million. Okay, so you used the cross cutting relationship of the dike being younger than the rocks it goes through and you used superposition to determine that it's younger than the granite.
Okay. Okay, so then here is a picture of the geologic time scale. So all the way on the left, you have eons. So we have the Precambrian, and then we have the Phanerozoic. Now you don't have to memorize these, okay? But the Precambrian and the Phanerozoic. And then within the Precambrian, we had the Archean and the Proterozoic. And then in, within the Phanerozoic, you have Cenozoic, Mesozoic, Paleozoic. And then those are expanded into smaller periods, epo epochs, and then it shows you the millions of years on the side. Okay, so we have eon, era, period, epic. Again, you do not have to memorize these, but remember earlier when I was showing you the fossil age ranges, it went Cambrian, and then I was showing you like Pennsylvanian, Triassic, Jurassic. So these are those num the same periods here. So now we're going to go through Earth's evolution through geologic time. And this is considered topic eight. And this is from chapter, chapter 19. So this lecture is topic seven and topic eight. Okay. Any questions so far? Otherwise, I'll move on. Um, I think we, we took a break about an hour ago. So, you know what, let's take another break, just like until three o'clock and then we'll, we'll come back. Hi, so we are going to just do some of topic eight now. We're going to finish the rest of it after exam number two, which is next class. So here is the geologic time scale. Again, I was just telling you Precambrian and Phanerozoic. The Precambrian history goes from 4.6 billion years ago to five, 542 million years ago. And during the Precambrian, that's when the oceans formed, the atmosphere formed, the earliest life developed on Earth and the formation of Earth's first continents. So the Precambrian spans almost 90% of all of Earth history. And that's when we had the origin of Earth 4.6 billion years ago. And then later on, we had the first one-celled organisms, and then we had our first multi-celled organisms after that. But this was 90% of Earth history. Okay, and it's shown in pink here. So about 10% of Earth history is just this little tiny section up here, the Phanerozoic. But we blow it up larger so we can see the details here. And a lot of the details are related to evolution of different plants and animals. So the origin of the atmosphere and the oceans. Earth's primitive atmosphere consisted mainly of water vapor and carbon dioxide, as well as methane and ammonia. The formation of the early atmosphere was greatly enhanced by the process of outgassing. 
That's when gases are trapped inside the earth and are released by volcanic eruptions. And this continues today, okay? We still have outgassing. Water vapor in the atmosphere was cooled and started condensing as the earth cooled. So eventually all this water vapor that was outgassing from the earth's interior, the water, some of the water vapor started to condense and form rain. And the rainwater started to accumulate in the lower lying areas on the earth's surface. And that eventually led to the formation of the oceans. Most of the present day amount of ocean water was already formed by about 4 billion years ago. So this is early life on Earth and the transformation of the atmosphere. One of the earliest known organisms were single-celled organisms that lacked a nucleus. These are called prokaryotes. One group of prokaryote called cyanobacteria lived in the early oceans. Sometimes it's also called blue-green algae. Cyanobacteria used solar energy to make their own food through the process of photosynthesis. As we know today, photosynthesis results in the release of oxygen. The photosynthesis of cyanobacteria eventually changed the composition of the Earth's atmosphere to include oxygen. So this is the start of an oxygen rich atmosphere, okay? Because just from outgassing, the atmosphere was mainly water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, and ammonia. So we didn't get oxygen in the atmosphere until we had a lot of photosynthesis from the cyanobacteria. So these bacteria lived together in colonies in a gel-like material called a biofilm or an algal mat. So it's like this sticky gel. And calcium carbonate sediment grains stuck to the gel and eventually layered mound-like limestone structures called stromatolites were formed. So these are ancient reefs. It's not like a coral reef. It's a reef formed from the sediment grains that got stuck in these biofilms from the bacteria. So the rocks in these reefs are called stromatolites. And you could see in the photos below, those are stromatolites. The oldest stromatolites found on earth are 3.3 to 3.5 billion years old. So that tells us early life existed on Earth at least 3.3 to 3.5 billion years ago. So any iron that was present on Earth was able to become oxidized to the new appearance of oxygen in the atmosphere. There was abundant iron in the oceans and that became oxidized. This led to the formations of iron oxide and chert, which we could see in what we call banded iron formations. Banded iron formations include dark layers of magnetite and red layers of chert that contains iron oxide. So these were formed during a time period when the atmosphere was becoming more oxygen rich because of the photosynthesis of cyanobacteria. Most banded iron formations formed three and a half to two billion years ago. And this is a photo of a banded iron formation at the Museum of Natural History in Manhattan. Also common during the Proterozoic was red bed sandstones 
shales and siltstones that are red as well. So we call them red beds because of their iron oxide cement, which is a red color. This is also related to the increased oxygen in the atmosphere. Basically it's rust. Iron oxide is rust. So iron that was in rocks and sediments became rusty because now there's oxygen in the atmosphere. So what about the formation of continents? During the early Precambrian, the Earth's mantle was hotter and that led to convection, faster convection in the mantle and more volcanism. That's because it was leftover heat from when the Earth had just recently formed. Most of the lava and the crust that was formed at that time was probably ultramafic because it was cooling at high temperatures. So if you remember from Bowen's reaction series, higher temperature minerals are ultra or are mafic. So if you have a lot of mafic minerals, that gives you an ultra mafic composition of a rock. Later on, as the earth cooled, minerals were able to form at lower temperatures, giving us less ultra mafic composition. The first crustal fragments formed as volcanic island arcs. That's from subduction related to ocean crust. So you had two pieces of ocean crust collide and then it would have formed volcanic island arcs. Also, we formed hot spots like present day Hawaii that also formed land and crustal fragments. As accretion and collisions occurred among the small crustal fragments, the pieces grew larger forming proto-continents. The new mini continents began to collide with one another forming larger land masses with evidence of metamorphism and deformation. And then you had some partial melting of rocks which formed a silica rich magma. And this shows you what we did when we did the mountain building, where we talked about pieces of volcanic islands colliding with each other, forming larger pieces. So in this case, it's showing you a few volcanic island arcs collided and then you start having some melting in the lower crust which gives us more felsic material. So this would be an early continent. This is like the beginning of continental crust. So the oldest continental rocks have been dated as 4.4 billion years old. And that's been determined by dating zircon crystals found within the rocks. This tells us that continental crust formed at least 4.4 billion years ago. And you could read more about it at this link. The rocks were found in Australia. So the early Precambrian is called the Archean. Those rocks are usually highly deformed granites, gneisses, deep water sediments, and green stones from metamorphosed ocean crust. Later in the Precambrian, the Proterozoic, those rocks are usually less deformed, shallow water shelf sediments, 
because once the continents were formed, there were more continental shelves. So you could have more shallow water sediments. Also, we had banded iron formations because now we have more oxygen in the atmosphere. If there are any questions, please let me know. So your large crustal pieces are cratons. So these Precambrian rocks that make up the stable main piece of every present day continent is called a craton. Where this Precambrian rock is exposed at the surface is called a shield. Where it is buried beneath younger rocks is called a platform. So that shield and platform together makes up the craton. So all of this is Precambrian rocks. Cratons at one point were strongly deformed, intruded by plutons and metamorphosed, but they have experienced very little deformation since the end of the Precambrian. So today, cratons are surrounded by younger rocks as a result of orogenies, like mountain building events, volcanic arcs, and sediment deposition. And this shows you the Precambrian cratons around the world. So the purpley pink color, gray, whatever color that is, the, the pinkish purple gray, is the buried Precambrian rocks. And the lighter pink color is the exposed Precambrian rocks. So both of those colors together make up the cratons. And these are rocks in Greenland, some of the world's oldest rocks. They have been dated 3.8 billion years. Our closest shield is the Canadian shield. And that's the exposed part of the North American craton. It's mainly in Canada, but also in Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, and New York. And that's all labeled in pink. And if you look closely, whoops, does anybody know what this part of New York is called? Like, what is there? There's mountains there. Anyone know what mountains those are? Those are not the Catskills. It begins with an A. Yeah, these are the Adirondack Mountains, that the pink circle that's like in here, in the New York area. Those are the Adirondack Mountains, correct. So the Adirondack Mountains are very, very old. It's oh, I wrote that. Hold on. That's how you spell it. A D I R O N D A C K. You're welcome. Okay, so then we have the Canadian Shields in this photo. This is just some of the rocks sticking up out of what's called Reindeer Lake. Okay, so where were the continents positioned during the Proterozoic, which is the later Precambrian? Archean aged mini continents were involved in collisions resulting in orogenies 
and zones of deformed rocks. These areas are called greenstone belts. In the early Proterozoic, there was a large continent composed of what is now known as North America, Greenland, and parts of Scotland and Scandinavia. That whole large continental piece was called Laurentia. 1.3 to 1 billion years ago, more land was added to Laurentia, and that led to what's called the Grenville orogeny. And if you remember from last class, orogenies are mountain building events. So the Grenville orogeny formed the Adirondack Mountains. Once all of that land was collided together, there was actually a supercontinent formed called Rodinia. So this is Rodinia. This is a representation of what Rodinia would have looked like. And Rodinia started about a billion years ago and went to about 600 million years ago. And if you see, if you look closely, the equator, look what, look what continents are on the equator. Antarctica, Siberia, they're on the equator. They are not in that area anymore today, but they were a billion years ago. And then look at the South Pole. The South Pole, Africa is at the South Pole. Okay, so things looked very different than they do today. And North America was in between the equator and the South Pole, right? We were in the Southern Hemisphere. So Rodinia was very different than where the continents are today. North America was pretty much in the center of this supercontinent. Again, that's when the Adirondack Mountains formed. So the Adirondack Mountains are a billion years old. So if you go upstate New York, there's rocks there that are a billion years old. Okay, so around 800 million years ago, and then finalizing 200 million years later, Rodinia broke up. After Rodinia's breakup, many of the continental fragments reassembled into another large landmass in the Southern Hemisphere called Gondwana. Okay, so continents break apart and then they come back together in a different orientation. So in the Gondwana was South America, Africa, India, Australia, and Antarctica. And now South America is at the South Pole and Africa has moved northward a little. At this time, where was North America? On the other side of the globe, these continents were not part of Gondwana. We had Siberia, Northern Europe, and North America. Okay, so those were not part of Gondwana after Rodinia broke apart. So that brings us to the Phanerozoic. And the Phanerozoic is broken down into the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic and the Cenozoic eras. So I just wanna ask before we continue, does anyone have any questions from the review sheets or wanna go over things that are gonna be on the exam next week? Okay, so what I'm gonna do, nobody's saying. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna continue the lecture then. I do have office hours after class as well. So if anyone wants to meet 
between four and five, we can um, go over review for the exam. Okay. So, Phanerozoic, again, I showed you this before, but the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic are then broken down into smaller periods. So first we're gonna talk about the beginning of the Paleozoic, the beginning of the Phanerozoic, which is the Paleozoic. So the Paleozoic begins with the Cambrian, 541 million years ago. And then we have our first organisms that had shells. And then we had the Ordovician, the Silurian, Devonian, the Carboniferous, which includes the Mississippian and Pennsylvanian, and then the Permian. And you could just read through, like it says, the first land plants, the first known fish. Fish were dominant during the Devonian, when we had all of our coal swamps, the first known reptiles. At the end of the Permian, we had a mass extinction, actually. Okay, so where was all the land? So the Cambrian, that was about 500 million years ago, there were six main continents. Baltica, China, Gondwana, Kazakhstania, Laurentia, and Siberia. Most of the land was now located in the low latitudes near the equator. So there was no polar ice because you need, when you, when you have land on the poles, that's generally when you form polar ice. If most of the land is towards the equator, then you're not really gonna have any polar ice. So the earth is gonna be warmer <clears throat> and the sea level is gonna be higher because you don't have water from the sea locked up in polar ice. And a little bit later, you had the Silurian, <clears throat> excuse me, that was 425 million years ago, is shown in this picture here. <clears throat> but the Silurian here lasted from 443 to 419 million years ago. Okay, but it, they're just diagrams depicting a snapshot of that particular age. So at 425 million years ago, this is generally where the continents were thought to have been located. So North America now collided with Europe, Siberia, and other smaller crustal fragments. Okay, so at some point Siberia here is gonna collide with North America. And then other little fragments of land are also going to collide. And we're going to form a larger landmass called Laurasia. So now this depicts 350 million years ago, where you have Laurasia and a separate large landmass called Gondwana. So what do we think is going to happen now? Pangea. So the, the, by the late Paleozoic, Gondwana moved northward and collided with Laurasia. And at that point, we formed Pangea. The name of the global ocean was called Pantalassa, or that's what scientists have named the ocean. So it would have been a global ocean, and then we had Pangea, which is what all the continents were stuck to Pangea. The Atlantic Ocean did not exist yet. The Atlantic will form later when Pangaea breaks apart. The Appalachian Mountains formed when Africa and North America collided, and that was the final collision that created Pangaea. And that was at the end of the 
That was during the Permian. So let's look back at Permian is here. So we just spanned a few million, of like a couple hundred million years in this conversation. Okay, so in the Permian, that is when the Appalachian Mountains formed and we formed Pangaea. So this whole lecture is just like billions of years of Earth history. So it's obviously a quick summary. We can't really spend a lot of time going over everything because that would take billions of years. Okay, so now what about life in the Paleozoic? The first appearance of animal skeletons and hard parts such as shells, bones, and scales, and teeth is seen in rocks from the Paleozoic era. Again, just I know it's a lot of different words that you haven't heard before, but again, Paleozoic is this whole era, this whole thing that we're talking about. Okay, this is the first era of the Phanerozoic. This is the Paleozoic. So now we have animals that have hard parts. Animals with hard parts are able to be preserved in the fossil record. Thus, there were many Paleozoic fossils in the rock record. So before this, we only had soft bodied organisms. So they don't really leave a lot of evidence of their existence. So the fossil record is not that extensive before we have animals that had hard parts. Think of like a jellyfish. A jellyfish does not really have any hard parts to leave a fossil behind. So fossils of jellyfish and animals like that are not that common because there's nothing there to really like leave a fossil. So life in the early Paleozoic was restricted to the seas and consisted of several invertebrate groups, including trilobites, cephalopods, for example, squids, sponges, and corals. So this, this uh, picture at the bottom shows you what the mid-Ordovician seafloor may have looked like. So you got squids and corals and sponges and like that kind of stuff, that kind of animal, those kind of animals. During the Cambrian, we have what biologists call a period of time that's the Cambrian explosion. The Cambrian explosion took about 10 million years and during those 10 million years, we had rapid animal diversification. Diversification means you go from a small number of different types of species to a large number of different types of species. Now, when they say rapid, it's 10 million years, okay? But in geology, that's fast, okay? So you got to think geology-wise, 10 million years is fast. So that's the Cambrian explosion. Okay, so we went from a small number of different types of animals to a whole lot of different types of life, lots of different types of species during the Cambrian. So it's like rapid amounts of evolution into different types of species. The first fish appeared in the fossil record in the Ordovician period. Okay, so I'll show you. The Cambrian is down here. The Ordovician happened next. Then in the Devonian, we had fish diversify. So we went from a small number of different types of fish to a lot of different types of fish. So the Devonian is called the age of the fishes because there was so many different varieties of fish. Some of the early fish were armored. 
for example, this Dunkleocetus, and they were like active, scary predators. I mean, this thing looks really scary, right? And that is important for the story of evolution. Because if you all of a sudden have all these lots of different types of fish and lots of them are like active predators that are armored, it's going to lead to a change in adaptation to survive. So some fish are gonna to start to go closer to the coast in shallower water to avoid these predators. Okay, they want to avoid these predators. They go closer to the coast. And then something interesting happened. We have adaptations for living in this coastal water that's shallow. And a particular type of fish called a lobe finned fish adapted to life on land. And it started as they adapted to living in the more shallow water near the coast. Okay, so they moved towards the shallower water and then eventually they started adapting to living there. And instead of having fins like most fish, their fins developed more like a strong appendage. And then eventually they were able to kind of walk on these appendages that adapted from fins. Now we're not gonna get into evolution and how like the genetics work and adaptation and natural selection. That's more for a biology class. We don't really have time to get into those details. But for now, we're just gonna talk using the terms like adaptation, okay? Like that's, just, that's what I'm gonna really get into, just that kind of terminology. Okay, so these early fish called lobe finned fish, again, the, it's a specific type of fish most of the other fish maintained regular types of fins. But these types of fish started to be able to like walk around. This gave rise to the first amphibians. Okay, the lobe finned fish, eventually some branched out and evolved into amphibians. So these early amphibians were vertebrates that were able to live on land, but also had to live in water because they, were able, they, they could dry out easily because their skin is still more adapted for life in the water. Also, their reproduction is more suited for life in the water. So there's a problem with amphibians and where to lay their eggs. So amphibians today, like frogs, they lay their eggs in water because they're, that's what amphibians do. They lay their eggs in water. Also, the early amphibians had to deal with gravity because if fish are adapted, they're suited and adapted for life in the water, their bodies are not adapted to be able to like hold them upright on land. So you had the effects of gravity on the bodies of these early amphibians. Also, how does the body get oxygen from the atmosphere? Fish use gills to get oxygen from water. So these adaptations of the lobe finned fish they developed stronger skeletons that were able to support them to stand up on these muscular fins that kind of acted like legs. And they developed lungs where they were able to actually breathe air instead of relying on gills to breathe from the water. 
The only thing is they still needed to live near water to reproduce. Okay, and modern day frogs still need to live near water so that they could lay the eggs. And then you, you know, you have tadpoles which look like fish and then they develop legs and then they're able to come out of the water. They develop the ability to breathe air, whereas tadpoles use gills. So here's your early amphibians and your lobe finned fish. And they have very similar fins. The amphibian, the bones got more fused together to make it a stronger leg. Whereas the lobe finned fish, it was not fin, it was more like a fin still. So organisms continue to diversify dramatically. So in the US, we did have a tropical climate during the Paleozoic because we were closer to the equator. Now that would be nice right now because I'm sitting here freezing. But anyway, we had insects and snails and plants began to inhabit land. So not all life was only in the ocean anymore. You had life coming out and inhabiting land. Later on in the Paleozoic, you had a lot of these swamps where you had a lot of plants living on land. And that's where most of our coal deposits from today, they formed during the Pennsylvanian period in these coal swamps. We call them coal swamps. Because that's where the coal deposits that we see today, that's where it formed. Because we had a lot of land plants now. So your Paleozoic plants included seedless vascular plants, which means that they re reproduce by spores. So I sh have a photo here of spores. Spores are like these little dots on a fern leaf. And this is a, a modern day fern. So ferns are seedless vascular plants. So early land plants faced problems of drying out. They faced problems with dealing with gravity and reproduction. So ferns actually need a lot of moisture they need to live near a moisture source because otherwise they'll dry out. So most of the seedless vascular plants were found in moist areas. So they thrived in coal forming swamps during the Pennsylvanian. At some point they developed tissues to transport water and nutrients throughout the plant. Then later on in the Paleozoic, we developed seeded vascular plants called gymnosperms. Having seeds freed the plants from having to live in moist conditions. So now plants were able to colonize nearly all of the parts of land. These were flowerless though. So today's examples are conifers, meaning they have pine cones, cycads and ginkgos as well. Those still exist, those types of plants, psychos and ginkgos. Okay, so these are gymnosperms. So on the left is an example of a cycad. And on the right is an ancient ginkgo fossil. And then on the bottom is a modern day ginkgo. See the leaf looks almost the same, it's the same shape. Now, what about our animals? Paleozoic vertebrates now developed into reptiles. Okay, so, so like, let's say a branch of amphibians would have adapted and evolved into the first reptiles. 
So reptiles are better adapted for life on land. They have skin that's able to help like keep the moisture in their bodies. Like they have scales on their skin. They have eggs that can hatch on land. Now that eggs have like a hard shell, it keeps the moisture inside. As opposed to a frog's egg, which is more like a fish egg, which has to be laid in water. So now reptiles are able to colonize all parts of land. Amphibians still have to be near water though. Okay, so reptiles are better adapted for living on land. So some of these early reptiles were pelicosaurs, which are fin back reptiles, like in this photo that I, this is a photo of a uh, pelicosaur skeleton from a museum. Then we had something called therapsids. Therapsids evolved from these pelicosaurs. Therapsids were advanced mammal-like reptiles. And by the end of the Paleozoic, the therapsids became the dominant large land animals. And therapsids are important for this story, as you'll see in a minute. So this is a picture of a therapsid. Therapsids included a group of reptiles called cynodonts. Cynodonts gave rise to mammals later on, about 225 million years ago. So mammals evolved from a line of reptiles called cynodonts. All of the other descended animals, um, sorry, besides the mammals, all of the other animals that came from therapsids went extinct. So there were other animals that descended from the therapsids, but mammals are the only one that did not go extinct, okay? I mean, we had, there were like five mass extinctions on earth where we lost many, many species. So um, the mammals survived, but other animals that evolved did not, okay? That's what that means. So mammals evolved from reptiles. Reptiles evolved from amphibians. Amphibians evolved from fish. So in mass extinction at the end of the Paleozoic, which is the Permian, again, you gotta, you gotta really go back and forth a lot because otherwise you'll forget what the words mean. So Permian is all the way up here. That's 298 to 252 million years ago. So there was a mass extinction at the end of the Permian. It was the greatest known mass extinction in history. It was possibly caused by a lack of oxygen in the deep ocean and increased carbon dioxide levels and it's thought that that possibly is what started leading to this mass extinction. 90% of all marine invertebrate species went extinct. That is a very high number, 90%. So only 10% of marine invertebrates survived. Invertebrate means it does not have a backbone. Okay, so only 10% of the species that lived in the ocean that did not have backbones survived this mass extinction. 65% of all amphibians and reptiles went extinct. So we're talking massive, massive amounts of species died out completely. Okay, but mammals, did not die out in this mass extinction, okay? Right, besides mammals, all other animals that descended from therapsids went extinct. 
No, I don't know if like maybe some mammal species did die out. I'm not really sure actually, but a lot of amphibians and reptile species went extinct. Okay, so I would like to end there because this next topic is kind of um, a complex one. It talks about sea level change and the evidence for that and everything. So I would like to end here, okay? So I'm just gonna make a note that we're ending at the Permian mass extinction. Okay, so at this point we have 10 minutes left of class. So if anyone wants to go over anything from the review sheets for um, metamorphic, plate tectonics, or the mountain building, let me know. Otherwise, if you want to come to office hours at four o'clock, you could do that. If you want to take like a 10 minute break and then meet me in the office hours, it's on Blackboard. You get there through Blackboard. Um, or you could email me during office hours time. You could email me as well. Does anyone have any questions about anything? Oh, I'm going to shut the recording.